Good morning, and welcome to today's virtual seminar titled Finding Insights in Big Data Sets, Surviving the Data Deluge, presented by Dr. Richard Gill. Well, good morning. I'm excited to, to be here and to, to talk a little bit about um, some of the transitions that, that we've been making in using um, instrumentation data uh, over the past five or six years. And uh, a little bit about me uh, that I used to be a, a professor at Washington State University and interacted on a number of projects with, with some of the, the developers here at, at Decagon and it's a, been a relationship that's continued since I've been a, at Brigham Young University for the, the last seven years. And so um, today I wanted to, to tell you about uh, some of the, the approaches that we took or that I took uh, as a novice in, in instrumentation. I was trained as a plant ecologist. The, at no point in my uh, my school training did I get any uh, any um, help in in understanding how to use uh, instrumentation. And, and so, so I'm going to show you some of the the transitions that we made um, over time and where we're at now to to use um, big data sets. And, and we're at a, a really exciting time now in terms of, of data, in that. Um, the data are becoming cheap and they're, they're abundant and there's lots of open source data that, that we can use. Um, but the, there was a paper that came out in Science in 2011 that, that talked about the, the environment we're in now. And, um, and, and Richard Baranuk said, the data deluge is changing the operating environment of many sensing systems from data poor to data rich. So data rich that we're in jeopardy of being overwhelmed. And, and I have certainly felt that, um, and I feel that the, some of the most important decisions that, that we're making now uh, as scientists is how we're going to, to operate in this data-rich environment. And so, so what I wanted to do is to tell you about three projects that, that I've been working on with, with people in, in my lab, um, starting with sort of our novice approach to, to understanding instrumentation and data management, um, into a project that my um, current PhD student is working on, um, looking at snowmelt hydrology, where where he solved a number of the problems that we identified in the first project, and then finally one where we've been much more deliberate about data management and how to deal with with large data sets from the beginning, and, and where I think we're, we're finally getting a good handle on how to how to manage uh, large data sets. And so, so, so really what I wanted to do is use some work that we've been doing on the Wasatch Plateau um, that started in 2002 um, and, and show you um, some of the mistakes that we made. Um, then transition through and show you how we started solving some of the problems that we identified in the, the first project. And then finally, looking at how uh, Understanding what the challenges are from the very beginning allows us to anticipate problems that, that we're having and or that, that we're likely to have and uh, and manage data in a way that, that I think in real time we'll be able to, to address some of the questions that we have. So when we started on the Wasatch Plateau, um, we were really interested in looking at how um, summertime precipitation influenced ecological processes. And so the Wasatch Plateau is, is a site where ecologists have been doing research um, since 1911. Um, it's really well understood and characterized. But we identified so, some interesting scientific questions associated with, with climate change. We uh, thought through if we were going to, to measure things continuously in the, in the environment, what sensors um, would we need? We then went out and, and bought them or constructed them, um, installed them, um, uh, hooked them up to data loggers. Uh, two or three times a year, we would visit the field site, um, download the, those data onto a laptop, export it as an Excel file, and, and then as the, the multiple investigators on the project uh, needed data related to, to the sensors, um, we would I, either email Excel files back and forth or, or finally set up a Dropbox account where we could, uh, could share data that way. And then individually we analyzed this data. And I think that this is a, a pretty typical workflow when, you, you, when we first started 
doing this type of work where um, we really could pay attention to every single datum. And that the questions that we were interested in, this is a, a simple schematic that looks at uh, at uh, water dynamics through the, the growing season, or through, through the year um, on the Wasatch Plateau. Um, and, and really what we were interested in is looking at how changes in the amount or the timing uh, of rainfall during the summer in the subalpine system altered ecological processes. And, and so uh, from a sensing um, perspective, what we were really interested in is um, some micrometeorological uh, information, so air temperature, uh, rainfall, um, but most importantly, looking at soil moisture. And so, so we put out uh, a number of Decagon sensors and hooked them up to, to Campbell data loggers um, to, to look at the, the, the timing of the, the dry down after snow melt and how much um, soil moisture changed with individual rainfall events. And these are the sorts of data that, that we got. And so, so the, we have three years worth of data here. Um, we've, we've got 2010, 2011, 2012 um, during the summer. Um, and so we've, in the upper three plots, we've got um, air temperature, air, uh, maximum air temperature, minimum air temperature, and then the bars show individual rainfall events. And then um, in the lower panel, what we have is uh, water potential that um, we uh, derived using moisture release curves and measuring uh, volumetric water content in the field. And, and what we see is that we have three very different years in terms of soil water um, dynamics. Uh, and we see that, that our treatment effects are, are what we would expect. That, that, that when we alter the timing uh, of rainfall, that, that we can increase the, um, the dry down periods between individual rain events. Um, and our drought treatments were able to, to reduce soil moisture significantly. Um, and from these data, the, we could actually uh, look closely at some, some ecological phenomena. And so, so uh, we were interested in how um, average water potential influenced the survival of tree seedlings. That um, We were interested in, in the expansion of tree line into the subalpine. And, and, and we found that average seasonal water potential was a, a good predictor of seedling survival. Um, and it was a much better predictor when we looked at end of season uh, water potential versus um, their likely, the, the likelihood of these seedlings surviving um, over the winter. And then we could also, from these data sets, pull individual dates out. And so when um, undergraduate students went out and measured gas exchange in these seedlings, we could look at, at, at carbon acquisition rates, so, so photosynthetic rates versus the water potential. And so we could use the, these um, well-resolved data sets to, to address these sorts of questions. Um, but it was all manually done. It was us going in and identifying the period that we were interested interested in averaging it. We did all of the post-processing in Excel, um, and it was kind of clunky. Um, and, and as we went through this process and really reflected on the, the issues that, that came with it, um, some of the most important that we identified is that because we weren't looking in, at the data in real time and oftentimes would go seven or eight months without being able to access our data, um, we ended up with data gaps. And um, so, so for example, uh, here we see in 2011 that right in the heart of the growing season, right when the, the data were, were most important to, to have and to look at, um, there's a um, multi-week gap. And, and it just happened that, that we downloaded the data and something happened uh, as the, the students were, um, were uh, downloading the data and, and somehow they, they turned off the data logger. And, and so, so we ended up with a big gap and, and we didn't um, recognize that gap until we went back and downloaded the data again. Um, the other thing that, that we had is that we didn't have a, a very good protocol for how to manage the files once, once we had them. And so we had problems with version control, where, um, where one investigator would go in and, uh, and 
play around with the data and sort them and analyze them and uh, and convert them to the units that they were interested in um, and save it. And um, the next person that came along didn't know if they were using raw data or converted data. And, and, and so there were issues with that. The other thing that, that we ran into is that this project has been going on long enough that the initial students that were working on it have left. And so we have new students coming in um, and we found gaps in our metadata as well, understanding exactly where every sensor is located and what it's measuring. Um, and we ended up, um, especially as we moved to Dropbox, where we could uh, simultaneously access files from from um, both in Pullman and in Provo and, and wherever uh, other people were at, that they, we ended up uh, saving different versions of the file and, and so, so the, the lower graphic there actually shows uh, what our Dropbox file looks like and, and what you see is that we have multiple files and this is even with us going in and cleaning it up, we have multiple files that have the same exact data in them and, and so, so we're, we have problems with redundancy um, with following modifications. Um, and, and so, so th there were some real issues that, that arose um, that, that the data were valuable, but, but I think that there's a better way to handle some of the problems that, that we ran into. All right, so um, uh, we started a, another project, um, and as we did this, um, we, I brought in a, a PhD student named Leif Connor, and Leif has been uh, really proactive in dealing with some of the, these data management problems. And what Leif is interested in is, or initially was uh, the phenomena of dust on snow. And, and so in the western U.S., what, one of the more interesting things that, that has been identified as a potential modifier of hydrology in, in mountains is spring uh, windstorms that blow dust onto snow. It changes the albedo of the snow and it changes the rate at which it melts. It, it accelerates um, snow melt. And so he started um, his PhD project looking at the sensitivity of subalpine systems uh, to snow melt timing. And, and, and um, he modified the, the conventional uh, approach in that after he identified what his question is, he just determined what his sensing needs were, and, and he was really fortunate in that he got uh, a Grant Harris Fellowship so that, that he could get some, uh, some extra instrumentation to, to install at his site. But before he installed it, he actually thought through the process of how he was going to manage those data as they came out and establish some protocols for, for, for version control and, and other things. And then he went out and he, he installed um, data loggers and soil moisture sensors. Uh, again, it was a remote site. The data stayed on the data loggers um, and the, he would install them in the fall. They would overwinter under the snowpack. He would go in and, and download those data uh, early in the spring as soon as he could access them. Uh, but now instead of um, saving them as individual Excel files, he, he developed a database um, that, that he could store them on. He identified uh, what were the dynamics in soil moisture that, that he was interested in, and, and I'll speak to that a little bit. And so he could automate some of the process of analysis, um, and then um, after he analyzes them, he could, can also make those data available to the public. And so, so this is Leif um, uh, uh, doing one of his, uh, uh, applying one of his treatments, he, he's skied out to one of his plots and, and he's adding dust to the snow to, to change albedo and to change snow melt timing. And what he was interested in is, uh, is understanding how advancing snow melt timing changed the pattern of soil moisture in the system and, and he could thought about it theoretically. And so, so really uh, what we have here is typical soil moisture um, from October to September, so in a, in a water year. Um, and what we see uh, here, at least in theory, is that adding dust to snow should accelerate the point at which you introduce 
um, more liquid water into the the soils, um, and so so you start the onset of the spring flush earlier. Um, but you would also get rid of the snowpack earlier, so you would start the spring dry down sooner as well, with, with the potential to increase the duration um, in which these soils are dry until monsoonal storms come in. And so, so, so this was his theoretical understanding, and so he thought about how it would be for him to have um, multiple plots, multiple sensors, um, and to do and to identify these important key transition dates without just doing it by hand, not having to to look at every single datum. And so he, he said, really, what we're looking at here is changes in variance. And so so he identified uh, changes in soil moisture, right? So so the variability of the data. Um, so he could easily derive these um, using R. Um, and so what we see is that for most of the winter, um, soil moisture is invariant. Um, it isn't changing very much. But as snow begins to melt, you start to substantially increase the variability that in soil moisture. And so, so at the onset of that, that's the, the, the transition from your winter low flux state to the spring high flux state. And you, you have these pulses that go through the soil profile, and, and so, so you end up with um, that period where the snow is melting and you've got a massive fluxes um, through the, the profile. It then stabilizes a little bit, and so you, um, you start uh, this, the end of the high flux state and into the dry down. And so during the dry down, from day to day, you're changing, but you're only changing a small amount. And then finally, you reach some point where um, you have dried down to to um, to the point where where it's relatively stable, and, and enter the summer dry phase until finally you start getting um, monsoonal storms in, in July and August, and their individual storm events create high variability. And so, so what he did is uh, he's actually written this up uh, as a way to to share his experience and. And what he did is he would take his EM50 data files, and so, so these are, are CSV files that, that have columns for every response variable. And what he was able to do is put together a, a fairly simple Python script that, that allowed him to strip out individual sensor data um, so, so that they have uh, a single sensor, a single time series that, that matches the, the protocol for the database that, that he was using um, and, and created all of these files by hand and then he would upload them as a batch um, to the database. And so now instead of worrying about version control and where the raw data are, all of the raw data are now databased and instead of doing analyses and storage in Excel files, the storage is taken care of in a hydro server database um, and he's able to, to pull from that database to do his analyses. And so, so this is a database that's publicly available and you could actually go in and find individual sites. Um, you, you can pull all the data from a site, select which response variables you're interested in, the, the time period that you're interested in, and analyze only those set of data that, that, you're, um, that, you're, uh, that you need for uh, the question that you're asking. And so he was then able to pull from the hydro server database, write an R program, an R script um, to identify those important inflection points. And from them, he's able to, uh, he takes uh, these, you know, hundreds of thousands of of individual data points and he's able to extract from them um, the, the important dates that, it, that he needed. And so, so we could, um, he's identified that the day that he first applied the dust, uh, the, the timing of the onset of the, the high flux period in spring, um, the, the point at which um, you are no longer having this high flux period and you're starting to dry down and the onset of the summer dry period. And, and so, so by doing, um, doing this, he's uh, substantially simplified the analytical process of looking at hundreds of thousands of data. So with this modified approach, there are obvious advantages that, that we found. 
Um, I think understanding in advance what you're going to do with your data is absolutely critical. Uh, but we still had some of the same problems. That is, that the, the data are all on the data loggers. Um, when we have sensor failure or, you know, in uh, field settings, you run into problems with wild animals and with, with rodents and, and other things that, that cause sensor failures. And he didn't wasn't able to see those sensor failures until he showed up later in the year uh, to download the data. Um, the, the data was downloaded to the laptop, but it takes a significant amount of time to, um, to run the Python script to, to, to strip out the data um, and to finally push it to the database. And, and, and really the, the big problem or the thing that is, is challenging as, a, as an investigator is the interval between when the data are collected and the time that you're actually analyzing them, right? So, so it's not until you know midsummer that you're looking at your spring data. That, that that there is this this gap that you know is a little dissatisfying, and it would be so much better if we could look at our data in real time and identify problems as they occur. And so, so we've um, finally um, got a project going on now where we've taken many of these. Uh, shortcomings that we've identified, anticipated them, and built solutions into the, the project itself. And, and so, so this is really uh, the, the point at which, for me, it becomes exciting to see the, the potential uh, of big data sets. And, and so, so from, from that same science article, um, we, we read, managing and exploiting the data deluge require reinvention of the sensor system design and signal processing theory. The potential payoffs are huge as the resulting sensor system will enable radically new information technologies and powerful new tools for scientific discovery. And so um, for us, the, the, we have an ideal system to look at this in. So we moved out of the, the mountains and into the deserts, and, and deserts in the west are experiencing um, a massive increase in wildfires. Uh, this is in large part due to the invasion of annual grasses. And so uh, along with a, a number of other professors uh, at BYU, we set up a large experimental system to look at the ecological factors that control um, recovery after uh, wildfires in the West. Um, in addition to this, uh, one of the, the things that we were most interested in is how soil moisture uh, controls the, the reestablishment of, of native vegetation or the, the increase in, in invasives um, as a result of the amount of water that's available to them. And so we built rain out shelters in order to manipulate um, soil moisture and, and the real value of, of a sensor network is being able to, to with high precision, measure uh, the, the effects of our treatments on soil moisture. And so, so we're worried about things like cheatgrass. This is a invasive annual grass uh, that is now found throughout the Great Basin and Columbia Basin. Um, this is what it looks like in late fall. It germinates in late fall. It will overwinter um, as a green plant. Um, as soon as the snows melt, it bolts, it, um, it flowers, it sets seed well before the, the natives do. It will then dry out and, and serve as a fuel if there's an ignition event and if there's a high amount of, of litter, a high amount of biomass. The other thing that, that we have in our Great Basin site is a, a, a toxic form called halogenin, and halogenin has a di very different uh, life history in that it germinates in the spring, it will goes through most of the, the summer as a really small rosette, and then it will bolt in late summer, early fall, um, and, and produce seed then. And so we have these two really bad invaders that, that are at our site, and we're interested in looking at how soil moisture um, as well as fire influence their abundance. And so this time, rather than just um, jumping in 
identifying what we should measure, putting sensors out, we actually went through a very deliberate plan on thinking about what we were going to do with the data as they came in. And so, so we had our initial question related to, to fire and soil moisture. We knew what sensors were available and, and that we could use. And we put together a data plan. And, and, and the data plan was, what data are we going to collect and how often? We, how are we going to do quality checks on those data um, and automate that process? How are we going to link the data that we're collecting on a data logger to the important metadata so that, that it becomes useful not just to us but to others as well? We thought through the process of saving these in a data repository and then figuring out tools to discover those data in real time. Um, and then for us, the really exciting thing was being able to, to then use the, the sensor data linked with more conventional ecological data um, for real-time analyses. And so, so we sat down um, and, and deliberately thought through what sensors we were going to, to deploy and where, how often our measurements were, were going to need to be, be made, um, and, and what was possible with the budget that we were working with. And so uh, as we sat down to plan, we, we actually stepped through this process. As we looked at data collection, we were interested in what could we, uh, what sort of response variables could we look at? And, and so we decided we wanted to build in some redundancy and measure both volumetric water content and water potential at the same plots um, for, for at least some subset of them. We wanted to measure um, reflectance, so, so measure real-time plot scale and DVI. And we also wanted to have uh, micrometeorological measurements. We didn't need those at every plot, but we certainly wanted uh, a good characterization for this, the entire site. Um, we did, had to think through how redundant we wanted this system to, to be. We had seen that we had had problems um, with uh, sensor failure that, that comes with just having sensors in the field. And, and so did we want duplicates everywhere? And, and we realized that that was impractical, but, but for about a fourth of the plots, we could build some redundancy into the system. We also had to th think about the data stream itself. Um, how much data could we manage? At what time interval did we need um, to, to make these measurements? And did they have to be the same for every measurement we were making? And so, so for the soil measurements, we, we ended up collecting data every six hours. For the micrometeorological data, what we did is we averaged hourly instead. And so, so we decided that, that our the frequency at which we were uh, uh, collecting data was going to, to differ depending on the, the actual uh, response variable. In terms of data, uh, we really were dissatisfied with this idea of waiting around and only when we go out to the site do we collect the data and then analyze it when it gets back to the lab. Um, well, we decided that, that given the investment we were making in, in instrumentation, that, that we really wanted those data wirelessly and we wanted to be able to look at them as soon as they were collected. And so, so we ended up uh, setting up a wireless network in order to, uh, to push the data to, to a server um, using EM50Gs. Um, and, and we were pushing that data every single day. Um, uh, the, for some of the responses that, that we were looking at, we had the option of either collecting raw data or actually doing the transformations in the data logger prior to uploading the data. Um, we chose to automate some of that. that um, there are also things that we can do post-collection. So initially, the, it's archived, um, it's saved as CSV files on the data loggers themselves, but um, but most of the archiving is actually now occurring as those text files um, being pushed to the, the, the central server. Um, we then can derive variables and do some calculations. Um, we had to think through at what point we were going to link the, the sensor data to the, the metadata. Um, the, the data loggers themselves don't, don't collect information about which treatment that the sensors are in or what depth. And, and so, so we had to, to figure out a way to connect those things and, and put them into the database. We had to figure out 
what we were going to do um, when there were problems with, with sensors, how we were going to gap fill data, if we were going to or not, and then how we were going to synchronize all of our data across a platform. And, and so, so we, we thought through all of this um, before we put even a single sensor into the field. And so, so finally, we, we went out to our research site, and um, it's been a, a really productive collaboration for me to be able to, to work with um, Colin Campbell here at Decagon. Um, and we actually sat out, uh, set out all of our, our, our sensors, um, got what we needed, and, and uh, went through the process uh, of the, the installation, um, and, to, and were able to, to test uh, that things were were uh, were working well um, there in the field, um, and so so we got went through the the uh, had all of the data streaming um, to the the server. Um, the the first real step um, that that wasn't already done for us that that is that the um, Decagon hadn't already thought through uh, everything in sort of gave it to us out of the box, was the attaching of metadata to the sensor data themselves. And, and so, so before we could upload anything um, to the, the database, we had to put together a, a, a lookup table. And this lookup table just matched um, the, the uh, data logger ID, the sensor ID, to what it was actually measuring. And so the, what we could do is then um, Using this lookup table f for every datum, we could attach a treatment um, to to the the sensor itself and and know what we were measuring. And, and so, using a Python script that that was uh, written by a, a graduate student, we were able to to um, to automate the process of pulling data from. Decagon server, um, attaching the metadata to it, and then putting it into our own database. We then again use this Hydro Server data repository. It's something that, that we've used in the past. And now um, we've um, improved upon the, the initial model uh, by uh, now, instead of having to have a graduate student or an undergraduate strip out individual uh, individual sensor um, columns. Now we've automated that and we've programmed it up. So, so now as soon as um, the data shows up on the Decagon server, um, we can run the, the, the process and uh, within minutes it will be on the Hydro server database. And the, the next piece is really one where um, the open source community has been a, a huge benefit to us. And, and that is that um, uh, the, the Kwasi uh, funded network through um, NSF has, has actually built a number of data visualization tools that can be added um, to, to websites. So, so these are ODM tools that if you can point them to the, the database, they're able to, um, to allow you to, to interact in real time with time series data. And so, so that's what we've been, um, um, been using and installing to, to analyze our data. And so these are available um, on the web, and, and, and they're, they're free and they're open source, and that you can modify them. And so, so there's real opportunity there that one of the, the issues that, that I've dealt with is just my own naivete associated to the with the work that goes into data management that that, that I didn't recognize how difficult this was that uh, when I first started this project uh, I was interacting with some of the bioinformatics people in my department and, and sat down w with some really advanced students and said here it is it's a it's a relatively straightforward process I've got sensor data I want to get them into a database I then want to visualize them in real time and I, I want to be able to analyze them identify sensor problems also um, to, to look at treatment effects that that sort of thing and their eyes got really big and I didn't understand why that why they, they weren't excited about this and finally um, I sat down with, with their professor and he says what you just described is, is about a four-year process right that, that this isn't something that, that you just do casually and, and 
I began to appreciate just how challenging it is to program something like this and do the web design and, and all the rest of it. Um, but I also discovered, once I recognized that it was difficult, I realized that other people had done it already. And, and with every project, we don't need to reinvent it. That, that, we, that these tools are available for us online. And so, so now we have um, the, these tools that, that are freely available and can, can be modified to, to meet individual needs. So now we're, we have the possibility of um, pulling those sensor data out of the database. We can look at them in real time and, and begin to develop hypotheses that align with some of the other questions that, that we have in the project. So for example, here we have a, an aerial shot uh, of one of the blocks of our experiment. And, and it's easy to see that the, that the upper left-hand um, corner and the lower right-hand corner, these were two plots that were burned. Um, the, the absence of shrubs shows you that. Um, but the other thing that you see is that there's a huge difference in vegetation between those two plots. One is bright green, one is brown, and, and um, that's because one of the treatments in this experiment is the presence or absence of small mammals. And so, so we begin to to look at, oh, there's a small mammal effect on vegetation after fire. But why is that? And what we're able to do then is pull sensor data, right? And so we pull the time series, the, the, the summer that, that preceded this image, um, and we can look at water potential between these two treatments. And what we see is that the one that is absent, the green, the, the one where the, there isn't uh, abundant halogen. It was much drier over the course of the summer, and it was much drier because um, cheatgrass was more abundant. And so, so we s were able to mechanistically link the the way that cheatgrass and halogen interact with one another, even though they're growing at almost exactly opposite times in, in these plots. And so, so now we can realize the full potential of these sensor data by linking them with more con conventional um, ecological data. And, and, and so I just wanted to finish up with, with this idea that these are exciting times for sensor system design, that as we have identified that the large issues that, that um, that come with managing data sets, um, and as more and more tools are being made available online, the, the full potential of of installing a sensor network is being realized. That we're being able to, to measure more, um, gain insights in, into processes that otherwise uh, were unknown to us, and, and address real world problems, but only after we figure out how to deal with the data.